Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to our joint seminar between the departments of chemical, environmental, and materials engineering, civil and architectural engineering, and mechanical and aerospace engineering. Today, we have the honor of having Dr. Qian Zhu uh, give us a seminar on computational design of bendable organics. Dr. Drew received his PhD in mineral physics from Stony Brook University and his BS in material science and engineering from Beihang University in China. Uh, he is a professor at UNLV, uh, working in the computational physics and materials area. And he is a recipient of the NSF Career and DOE Career Awards, both very prestigious award. So I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Joe. Please go ahead. Okay. Thank you. So first of all, I would start by thanking the uh, Professor David Chin for this kind of invitation. It's a really great opportunity to talk to you about uh, my recent uh, research about this topic of like design of bendable organics. So I will start now. So uh by the way so because this is like uh i see like a issue with zoom meeting zoom seminar it's like so we don't have enough eye contact i'm not sure why i was speaking i'm not sure like uh, how many of you are following so i would suggest so if you you really want to clarify something during in the middle of my presentation, please feel free to interrupt interrupt me so that I I am sure every uh, we are in the same page during my presentation. So, uh, before I give my research, uh, give the presentation on this specific topic of design of organics. I would like to give you an overview about uh, the research activities in my group. So at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, I will call UNV from now on. So I'm leading a research group aimed at this kind of computational materials discovery. So we hope to power the discovery of new materials by developing the new scientific codes and also supercomputation. So we at my group, we are very actively developing codes, uh, uh, open source codes for different purpose of materials research, including the prediction of crystal structures, also process an analysis of crystal structure based on their symmetry information. And, uh, that, and also we are developing the machine learning potential to boost the large scale atomistic simulation with a quantum mechanical accuracy. So after we develop the code, we also apply them to study different types of materials. So in terms of applications, I'm mainly focusing on two topics. One is the electronic property of a material at a kind of less uh, crystal scale. And we also, we, for instance, we are interested in this kind of energy material, energy, uh, electronic materials we are, which are useful for energy applications and uh, also organic materials, uh, especially for the organic electronics. And secondly, we are also interested in the study of the microstructures, um, for instance, like defects, grid boundary, surface reconstruction, and uh, the structure uh, the structure property relations especially the mechan uh, the uh, the change of the the impact of structure on the mechanical properties so that's that's about my research so in this topic so i'm not going to go over all of them but i will so i will include some of our code development regarding structure prediction crystal informatics and the, mostly I will talk about the organic materials. I will also talk a little bit about this phase transition behaviors. So here is the outline of my talk today. So first of all, I will begin with the 
introduction of a special relatively like rare phenomenon uh, for the organic materials. So it, this is kind of counterintuitive uh, and also kind of exciting uh, discovery in the recent years. People found some materials are actually are more uh, are quite flexible. So if you apply some mechanical stress, they can bend like the rubbers. So, but they don't know they, uh, there are a lot of experimental evidence and the experimental observations, but a lot of so many mechan uh, mecha uh, mechanistic studies. So, uh, so in this talk, I will introduce to you some numerical simulation technique, which we developed to enable the dialectal modeling of the bending of these organic crystals. And we also utilize this atomic simulation to derive some new mechanism to explain the physical origin of this bending behavior. So lastly, I will, also, I will talk to you about how to combine our, the, uh, our proposed mechanism with our earlier work, our early work in materials discovery to to enable a rapid screening and the design of new candidate organic materials with the combined uh, combined with the combined properties in terms of charge uh, electronic property and also mechanical properties. So that's it. So I will now I will talk about the organic crystals for most of for the entire uh, of the talk. I, when I talk, when we say organic materials, mostly I mean the small molecule organic crystals. So, so probably the most, uh, the most well, well known example for you guys are the, uh, about the organic crystals will be the medicine application. For instance, here we have a lot of drugs, uh, chem, uh, drugs are based on this small molecule uh, organic crystals like aspirin. And also you can think about something like pesticide, like DDT. This is also, it's also based on this kind of organ, organic crystals. So this, uh, people are interested in this because they have some attractive chemical properties, right? And uh, in addition, so in the, since last, uh, uh, since 90, 50 or 60s, so people discovered these organic molecules, when you make them as a material, they can they also have some nice uh, physical property. For instance, uh, they can serve as organic semi they can serve as semiconductors. So, so you yeah. So as I said, so they uh, these these organic molecules are interesting for different um, materials application due to its uh, attractive chemical properties or chemical properties, but if you think this as a material, uh, so you also need to can, so you also need to consider some like uh, engineering process, right? You want to make a material, you through, you want to form do some drug formulation or fabricate this material, uh, fabricate this uh, materials. You need to consider the mechanical properties. So now let me give you a quiz, but I'm sure all of you already know the answer because I already showed you the reason why we study this material. If you, now you, you see, if you have a organic, uh, um, like a needle shape uh, organic crystals, now you do this kind of so-called like three point like a bending. So after the bend, what will happen to this material? For most of the case, you will see this kind of brittle uh, fracture behavior. So it's just like, it's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like ceramics. So it's not, it's the, yeah, most of the organic crystals are brittle. So however, but uh, in the, since 2004, so an experimentalist actually found some of the crystals actually can sustain a uh, much larger deformation upon this kind of like a bending. So for, let me replay the movie. So you can see for this, uh, uh, for this crystal, if you bend it, you can see, so it, is, uh, it can actually 
it actually can bend significantly. And also when you release the stress, it become, it returns to the same state. That's a sign of elastic deformation. And for this case, you bend it, and then you see this process is not reversible. It's a indication of plastic deformation. So therefore I'm saying, so some of the materials are actually, are actually highly, inelast highly elastic or plastic. So this behavior actually is not very common, but also is, but in the recent years, people found them a lot of examples about this kind of phenomenon. So here I'm just showing you another remarkable example. So you can see, so people create the glow the crystal from this for these three molecules. These three molecules mostly share very similar uh, backbone. So it has like four, four benzene rings. They only differ in the side groups here. So when they form the crystal, they will form some kind of similar, like kind of layered packing. You see these are kind of distinct, uh, distinct layer. These are distinct layers colored uh, with different colors. So, but when you apply this kind of mechanical load, so you can, for these three, uh, three very similar molecules, they actually have totally different behavior ranging from the brittle fracture to elastic recovery and the plastic bending. So they uh, remember, so they only differ a little in terms of the molecular structure, but they, the mechanical property are totally different. So this is actually quite exciting. So in the past years, people actually found many, many different examples in experimentally. So here is another example with a molecule called, uh, called the coumarin. So they actually, I give this example because the they polymorph of coumarin was also, was also solved to propose by, by me and my collaborators in, a few, uh, in 2017. And then uh, uh, another experimental group actually took our sample and then they did this, they did this mechanical bending test. They found, then, then they told me, they told us, you see, uh, actually, the coumarin can be can be very can be very can be very flexible under this kind of uh, bending test. Yeah. So just to summarize, so from the experimental side, so there are a growing a growing number of reports about this kind of new phenomenon. So people are also trying to link this to uh, instead uh, uh, to trigger this kind of mechanical deformation. Uh, by using the photons. So the, a lot of like studies on photomechanic uh, crystals. So they are generally called, people generally call this type of material as mechanically responsive materials, which is very obvious from this phenomenon. And uh, of course, the most, the most attractive application for this material could be some kind of flexible electronics. We want to make some, so, there is a hope that people can make like fle uh, flexible displays based on this, uh, this, this type of materials. So a lot of like uh, increasing evidence about on the experiment side. However, if you look at the theory side, so they understand people, we still have a very, very poor understanding regarding the, regarding the mechanism, regarding why, to explain why some materials are more bendable than others. So in the past, people, someone proposed a so-called bending model to explain what will happen when you apply the deformation. They sort of, uh, they sort of provide a picture that so for to treat, to enable this kind of flexibility upon bending, so the material must form some kind of distinct layers, and then the interaction between layers are weak. So upon bending, you can see some kind of slip of the address uh, between between the between the laboring layers. So this is kind of picture which is kind of similar for people when people use that to uh, explain the plastic deformation in for the metals. So you have some kind of layers, and then with because of because of the form, formation of some dislocation, 
and then the dislocation can uh, the dislocation can migrate. So this actually contributed to plastic deformation. This picture, but you, but you can see this picture is not that convincing for two reasons. So first of all, so there is no, so far there is no direct evidence to ob uh, to uh, uh, to observe this so-called like a formation of dislocation in the molecular crystals. So during uh, during the uh, during the bending uh, test. Secondly, you see, so if you follow this model you will see as long as the deformation uh, is significant. So looks like they, all of the deformation should be plastic. But uh, as I just showed you a few minutes ago, so the deformation can be also elastic. So they can return to the same state. If you follow the dislocation theory, this, this won't happen. So therefore this is not, uh, to, in my opinion, and also every, a lot of people don't quite agree with this uh, this model. So, so uh, from the simulation perspective, people also study, people also try to use some indirect an analysis to understand the behavior. They perform some kind of like, a, for instance, shear or tensor deformation to based on this based on this stress and stress, uh, strain relation. Uh, so they want to infer the material is more whether or not more plastic or more elastic. So just to give you a quick summary about the current state uh, status, as I mentioned, so they are from the simulation perspective. So we, we can, there is no direct way to model this kind of bending deformation uh, to our knowledge. So some, a model, a bending model was proposed, but it uh, seems, looks like this is a very, uh, this this model actually is very limited to explain this experiment observation, also because of the lack of the understanding of the mechanism, atomistic mechanism. So we don't so far. So we have no predictive model to guide the experiment to find the new material of uh, to find the new new materials which are mechanically flexible. So a lot of the discoveries so far are kind of accidental. So trial and error, people try a lot of materials from the example, from the database. So sometimes they succeed, sometimes they don't. So to address this challenge, so in this study, I'm going to show what we are aiming to do. So we want to, to uh, develop some like dynamic, dynamic simulation type pipeline so that we can uh, directly observe this bending from our simulation. So we also want to understand the atomistic mechanism. And based on this mechanism, we hope we can come up with some uh, rational, uh, rational guidance, uh, guide to a uh, rational model to guide the design the screening of these materials, this type of materials. So in this talk, I will mainly consider three, exam uh, three crystals, which I showed earlier. Uh, for our simulation study. So as I showed you these three examples, they, this example is attractive because now we can, we can actually, it allows us to fully understand the dependence between the molecular structure, crystal packing, and also mechanical behaviors. So I want to give you a, a more detail about this crystal packing of this molecule, uh, of these three examples. So you can see when they form the crystal, so they, here I highlight the difference in the functional groups. So I will, the they brittle, the materials, which is the example, has the functional group of propyl and the elastic sample has a functional group of SEO and the, uh, this plastic example has the functional group of mesial. So they, they remember, so they all mo at the molecular level, they only, that's the only difference. And when they form the crystal structure, the brittle one has a more complicated packing, but roughly you can still consider they actually form some kind of layered packing uh, along this, along this Z axis 
you, you can consider this as one layer. This is a second layer. So this is the same thing for the elastic and the plastic crystals. They also form this kind of alternative layers. So in particular, you can see the elastic, the elastic sample has a very similar crystal structure packing as compared to the uh, plastic examples. Yeah, so that's all we know by analyzing this crystal structure by eye. So now our goal is to set up a simulation to directly understand the deformation. So I'm mostly doing atomistic simulation. So for those of you who are not familiar with atomic simulation, I will give you a quick uh, introduction about the techniques we are relying on. Mostly we are relying on the so-called molecular dynamic simulation method. So what is mole molecular dynamic simulation? So it's basically, uh, we have a box, you, you create a box like with a lot of particle. The particle can be the molecules or atoms. And then you start with some initial position and velocity for this, for each particle. And then with some kind of like a force field, with some kind of energy model, you can calculate the energy and the force for each particle. And then you follow this Newtonian dynamics to update the position and the velocity for each, uh, for each particle within a, within uh, the longest simulation for a, uh, for a given time frame, So you are able to see this kind of ad atomic evolution. So obviously this, this method has a lot of advantage, but it actually offers you the direct modeling of this microscopic process. We, for instance, we want to see this deformation. And also it gives, from this kind of trajectory, you plug in with like, uh, pl uh, you use some statistical mechanics, then you can actually also extract a lot of like uh, interesting physical quantities, like the diffusion constants and also the free energy and so on. But this method is, uh, uh, is not perfect in some, uh, in a few sense, uh, in, a, uh, in a few senses, for instance, the accuracy relies on how uh, the accuracy relies on the energy model. So relies on the approach you use to compute the energy. So some, most of the time we call it force field. And also they are suffer from this length scale and the time scale issues. So in most of the case, we can only handle the, So here is the regime of the simulation, which I'm talking about. We can handle some kind of models between nanometers and the micrometer scale. And the time scale is about the picosecond to the microsecond. Yeah, so that's, uh, what, uh, that's about the limitation. So with that, so I, we spend a lot of time to create uh, the model for this, uh, to enable the MD simulation. So we take this single crystal sample, we did some equilibration to get the uh, to get the reasonable uh, lattice constants. And then we oriented the sample to create the super lab model that mimic the experimental setup. And then we do equilibration and apply loading. So to mimic the experimental setup of the bending. So, so the experimentally, you, in order to make a bending, you have to pick three points. So the first two points will be the contact points to hold the sample. And then you have uh, a point in the upper, uh, in the upper middle, uh, so as indenter to push this, uh, to push this materials going down to, to, uh, to trigger the bending. So they just here is a little bit about the parameter and the software. So for this simulation, we are using the most common uh, software called the LAMPS. So with the uh, amber force field. So due to the limitation, which I mentioned uh, uh, above, so we are not able to model the very uh, experimental sites 
uh, the real, realistic like sample. Instead, we can only model up to some kind of, we can only do some simulation up to 7,000. We run of 7,000 molecules, which is already considered to be very, very big, uh, very expensive nowadays. So we run the simulation at a long temperature with a with different like indentation rate here. So just to give you an idea how expensive it is. So typically each run will take uh, like one or two days on a supercomputer super with about 300 cores. Yeah, so it's a, it's a relatively cheap, uh, expensive calculation. So here I'm gonna just show you uh, what we can achieve with this model. You can see, so we can actually nicely reproduce the, um, the brick, brittle uh, deformation as well as the plastic deformation. So let me play the movie again. Yeah. But uh, remember, so uh, we can reproduce the same phenomenon, but they are at a different time scale and the length scale. So for our case, we are talking about nanometer, but in experiments, it's about a micro, micrometer, hundreds of micrometers. So despite this kind of difference in the time scale and the length scale, we can, re, uh, we can re, uh, robustly pr reproduce this picture. We can also understand this from this atomic trajectory. So here we can, as you can see, so when we apply the loading, so the brittle and the elastic deformation will tend to have high energy increase when you, well, with the incre increment of uh, indentation, indentation, uh, indentation depths. So if you look at look at the sample, you can see. So they, you can also see, you can all, all, all clearly find, identify this critical point where the material started to uh, start to break. And on the other hand, if you have some kind of plastic example, so you see the energy change is uh, much less. Also, you can see some kind of different pattern. So it's different in the, uh, yeah, some kind of different pattern, which is uh, actually good indication that the materials has uh, different behavior. And also um, then if you release the load for this, uh, for this plastic and elastic example, you can see, uh, it's also very obvious to can find. So the energy does not, for the elastic, uh, uh, deformation, the energy will return to the initial state. But for the plastic example, it won't return to the initial state. Yeah, so this is also a good uh, uh, direct evidence, which shows that our simulation can correctly reproduce this brittle elastic and the plastic deformation for this. What, what is the energy? What What is the energy? What is, is the is the kinetic energy or potential energy? This is total energy. This is total, total energy. energy. Yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, this is potential energy. Yeah, because okay, actually- Okay, potential energy. Yeah, yeah. Be, due to the limitation of the, this is a long equilibrium process. So uh, kinetic energy should not be included. Yeah, this is potential energy. Yeah, that's a good Okay. Question. Yeah. Um, do you mm -hmm. also consider, uh, so there is any any change of the is any change of electronic state? Um, so here we are using classical force field. So in the classical force field, only consider the force. We don't have to. We cannot. Yeah, I, know, the yeah, I know. I know. I, I, yeah, yeah. I mean. I mean. Um, um, is any electronic process involved in this process? that you, you fail, you fail to, to simulate? That's a good question. Actually, I will talk about this in the end of my uh, presentation. Yeah, to, to, consider, to, uh, to consider how to combine the electronic okay. pro process with the mechanical okay. deformation. Yeah. Okay. yeah, I will talk about thank this you. later. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you for clarifying. Yeah, yeah so, so far, I hope I have convinced you that we, our simulation can correctly reproduce the experimental behavior in terms of deformation. But uh, we really want to know it's the mechanism, right? So we want to know what's the driving force to trigger this kind of, uh, which leads to result in different uh, behaviors. 
we that so the advantage of molecular dynamic simulation is that now we have a entire trajectory of this uh, atomic position or molecular position during this uh, deformation process. We can try to understand this by analyzing some particular motions. So we try to, to analyze these motions in different way, and then we figured out the most effective descript uh, way to analyze the motion is to look at the rotational events. So unlike the unlike the metal, so which are composed of atoms, the atoms are basically a spheres. So but the molecule will have different shape. So when you apply this, uh, when you apply this uh, bending uh, bending stress, the rotation will be the distinct characteristics to uh, to understand this process. Therefore, we see we decide to track the rotation, uh, the rotation during the simulation. So just to give you some idea about the, our definition about the rotation. So. We each rotate, so each molecule can rotate along three main axes, X, Y, Z. So we define them as uh, alpha, beta, gamma. So, and then we track the rotate, the overall rotation as compared to the, as compared to the initial sample. So yeah, we track the change in uh, the rotation in alpha, beta, and uh, gamma for all of them. So here we come up with the distribution. So for three different samples, we check the distribution of rotation on alpha, beta, and gamma. As you clearly can see, so in they don't the the distribution in alpha and gamma is much lower than the distribution of beta. So they don't look too different in alpha and gamma for three different system. But the beta is, the, for the beta, rotation uh, on beta, it's very obvious they are very different. So this is actually can be roughly understand from the mechanical perspective. So consider you are compressing the sample in the z-axis. So think about there are molecules. So you can see, so because of the, uh, because of the, the force, is the uh, is the force here as I'm pointing here? So the most uh, most easy rotation will be the rotation along the y-axis. So therefore, beta is will be the primary rotation event for to describe this deformation. So and uh, then yes. sorry, mm -hmm. what what is a what is a in the in bracket alpha? in the you mean a. alpha here? No, 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 no. In the beta, you have a, a brittle. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's angstrom. It's angstrom. This oh, it's is angstrom. tells you the uh, indentation depths. So okay. remember for the brittle case. So okay, okay. It, when it reaches the 3.6 angstrom, the materials mm. be, uh, becomes broken. Yeah. Mm. So the elastic sound. So I need to pick the so I started with the initial configuration. I need to pick up ending point to compute the rotation. Okay. Yeah, that tells you the state. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. that's a good question. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, so here we can clearly see some materials dependence. So some molecules are, are easier to rotate compared to other molecule. This is uh, a very obvious because of the rotation inertia. Remember. They have the molecule. Each molecule has a different mass. So if the molecule is uh, uh, more heavier, then it's uh, more difficult to rotate. Therefore, for the brittle example, so it's the it has the biggest mass. So the rotational freedom is much more li limited as compared to the other two examples. So I also want to uh, point out so. They distribute. Uh, if you look at this beta distribution, um, you can you can also see. So the uh, the plastic example has the largest freedom of rotation. So, but the distribution is not symmetric. You see the peak here, the brick, the peak of green here on the right side is uh, obviously bigger than the the peak on the on the left side. So 
as I will discuss to you later, so this is actually an important uh, descriptor to explain why uh, why this uh, why it is, why this uh, ME example is a plastic deformation. So here, let me give you some uh, give you show show you some like a typical trajectory why apply deformation for three different example. For the brittle example, you can see so this is the color. Uh, I it's the same. They this three uh, three structure are the same, but now I just uh, use color coding, uh, different color coding on beta, alpha, beta, and gamma angle. So you can see for alpha and the gamma, they are mostly kind of they don't they nearly don't rotate. So that's why you see some green pattern here overall. And then when you when you check the change in beta, you can see so beta has more obvious has more rotation. So as reflected by this color change, also it's kind of roughly symmetric. So if you just keep applying this uh, keep applying indentation, you see the color becomes darker, and also uh, they finally just get a get a, a crack. They form a crack in the middle. So, but overall, if you compare the left and the right side, they are very symmetric. So this is actually an indication of like a, a linear elastic uh, change of the stress and uh, linear uh, stress and strain relation. So now if you look at the elastic example, it's very similar. Now, except that, so you will see more blue and red colors in all these kind of three different rotation views. So this basically just indicates this material um, this material uh, can have a more rotational freedom. So this actually also explains why, uh, this actually can also explain why this material, uh, this material can sustain for uh, under, uh, under, under more bending. So last example, also the most interesting example is the plastic, uh, plastic deformation. So for the plastic molecule, when you compress it, it's different from the previous example uh, in the region which I highlighted as the red eclipse. So you see actually when you apply the bending, you will see actually this, this time, it actually, it's actually also forms some kind of bump when you compress, uh, when you do the indentation. You will see a bump and also you can see the bump will become more obvious in the in some middle stage, and then later on, the bump will actually become less obvious when you continue to compress it. So this actually, if you look at this more carefully, so actually we can figure out why this is a plastic deformation. So what happened? So if you look at this bump region, so this region which I'm highlighting here, so the molecule alignment are different compared to the others. So this actually is because so when during this uh, during this kind of indentation process, you can see the upper surface will suffer from a big compressive stress. So now due to this compressive stress, the figure trans uh, a phase transition will be triggered in this region. So the molecule not just a change gradually, the molecule uh, will suddenly change the alignment. In a collective, uh, in a collective way, so therefore all of these molecules in this uh, in this region have different alignment as compared to the uh, other molecules. So this is exactly phase transition. So after phase transition, so molecules in this region get different alignments, and then this alignment will form a new domain. So they, this domain will form a, will also have an interface with the parent with, with, the, uh, with the parent matrix of molecule. So when you, so when you can when you press it further, you will see so this interface actually will play an important role. So the molecule, uh, the interface has a low energy, it can slide the inter so they, they, this domain of molecules, the new domain, can actually freely slide up and down because of the 
low sleep value energy, sleeping energy. So in the beginning, so because of the compressive stress, this molecule, this domain will be forced to slide up. So you will see a obvious like bump, but uh, later on when you continue to compress it, so because now in the lower surface, in the lower surface, lower region, so there are a lot of um, tensile stress, so they are, which will create, the molecules will become more and more flattened in the lower bounds, and then this will create a more empty space. So therefore this, uh, uh, this domain will slide down to fill up this empty space. So you can consider, so, so they, this, uh, they say this, uh, this new phase can serve as a buffer zone to freely slide up and down so that it can adjust the day to minimize the local stress to achieve some kind of low energy state. So interestingly, if you look at the previous uh, experimental results, actually they, you can also see some kind of bump uh, during, it's very similar like what we found in, the, in our simulation, even though they are at a different length scale. So we hope, we believe this actually, yeah, this actually can serve, the, serve as an, another evidence to verify our hypothesis, our, our, our hypothesis. So, so far I have told you, so they, we believe the plastic deformation is due to the, due to the phase transition, um, uh, phase transition events uh, triggered by the deformation, triggered by, by the deformation. So this actually explained why some materials are plastic, but we still don't have the fully understand why the remember elastic sample and the plastic sample has very similar molecule and the crystal packing, but they they have different behavior. We still don't understand why. So therefore, we actually seek to do more careful energy analysis. So what do we do here? Now remember, we defined this uh, molecule by uh, based on the uh, we divide the molecule in the crystal uh, into into different groups based on the rotation. And then now we can do what? We can do an experiment to start by starting with the crystal structure, initial crystal structure. We just uh, rotate these two groups of the molecules uh, along the beta, uh, uh, along the y-axis, and then we track the change of energy. We do this for three different examples. Now we this uh, we have we do there are two degree of freedoms rotation R one on this uh, R one on the red atoms and the R two on the white uh, on the blue atom blue molecules. So you can see then we plot the energy surface. Now you can see actually they form very different energy surface for the three examples. For the brittle example. So it, you see they have a very, very limited degree of freedom. So if you start with the equilibrium state, which is zero and zero, so it, it, they, if you, increase, you rotate only a little bit, it will get a very big energy penalty. This actually explains why the materials don't, uh, are very limited in, in terms of rotation. And then they, have, yeah, they, they, will, they will break quickly upon the bending. On the other hand, if you compare the elastic and the plastic uh, uh, samples, you will see they, have, they roughly have this very similar shape. So you have, uh, uh, you, you have the global energy minimum always zero, zero. That means your starting point before you apply. It. After, when you apply the bending, you will see they will, the energy will increase, the energy will increase, and the plastic example have relatively wider spread in terms of the energy. So when you rotate more, the energy uh, increase, uh, uh, the energy penalty is less. Um, however, this is not the key difference. The key difference is uh, here. So you see, uh, if you rotate the sample strongly, so in principle, you can achieve another energy minima. Here I call LM. Um, however, for the elastic example, so these two states, act in order to uh, change, turn this state from GM to LM, 
you have to cross a very, very big barrier. So there is a big barrier. Yeah. But for the plastic example, so there is a much smaller barrier. So therefore, so you can, for plastic example, is more, is more likely to actually to achieve this second state by crossing a small barrier. So when you achieve this state, you will see this, uh, this kind of like a new, a new domain of phase. So therefore we conclude that, so notation energy, uh, notation and energy surface can be used for descriptor to tell the difference between three different examples. And uh, this, this material, the last material is plastic because there exists a low energy barrier between these two energy minima. So therefore it's fit. So under finite temperature, when you apply the deformation, so this event will, uh, the phase transition will occur and then this will lead to the plastic deformation. Okay, so that's about the, our, okay, yeah, I, I think yeah, I need to quickly wrap up. Yeah, so, so that's about our study. We have, hope I, so far I have convinced you that, so we can directly model the, we can provide a dynamic simulation to model this bending. And also we provide some uh, mechan atomic mechanism. Then I will talk a little bit about how we uh, uh, use this mechanism to guide the screening of the, uh, new materials that are likely to be mechanically flexible. So the way we do this is to we hope we want to find we hope we want to find some quickly identify some organic crystals which are likely to have mechanically flexible behavior. So as I just mentioned, crystal packing will be an important factor. So now the goal is how can we extract the so suppose we already experiment, we already identify a crystal that are like, that have, are mechanically flexible. How can we find the uh, the structures with similar crystal packing uh, from the database? So they therefore we develop the way to uh, to to basically to quantify the crystal packing. The basic idea is so we starting from the. Uh, from the environment, the packing environment of the molecule, we build up some energy map, and then they, uh, this energy map is intrinsically some kind of spherical image, and then we can use spherical harmonics to to store this packing based on a number of coefficients, and then with these coefficients are rotationally invariant. Therefore, we can use this. Uh, we can use the. We can measure the similarity based on this uh, coefficients. Of course, this, this will also involve some minimization, optimization process. For, uh, for the sake of uh, simplicity, I will just skip the detail so far, uh, for now. So just basically, by using this uh, tool which we developed, we are able to do automated quantification of classification of the organic crystals we compared our results with the previous results, a very famous article uh, published by the Horagio uh, back to 1989. So in that paper, they manually did some classification for 40, uh, 40 hydrocarbon crystals by, by eye. Then they proposed they propose this four types of, four types of packing, packing motif. And now with our exam, with our approach, we can do this, we can do this, uh, we can do this uh, in an automated way. Also by using our approach, we basically get the very similar results. Also we can use this to identify some outliers which cannot be well explained in the previous article. Yeah, so now we, you have this tool. So we are using this tool to screen this, uh, uh, possible new candidates from this uh, from the database, and then later on, so we are also working on the discovery of new materials. So in this case, they we only have molecular information, but we don't have the crystal information. So this actually is related to my earlier work in the uh, in terms of the so-called material structure prediction. I will quickly skip this. So, but I just want to let you know. So. What we can do, 
So we can reliably predict the crystal packing if the molecular information is provided. So the idea is that we can use in the so-called global optimization method to, to quickly explore the entire, uh, entire configurational space based on different molecular packing and then use this to predict a very complicated structure, a, more, a, a crystal structure. And we have already used this for many different applications. So with this software, we have already, we help the, we help the experiment, our experimental collaborator to solve their crystal structures uh, uh, for many, many different examples in the past few years. So this software, which we are, we are developing is called, uh, what's called a pi crystal. And uh, recently, we also developed a new software based on this open source code uh, by, collabor by collaboration with uh, people in Sony company. So we developed a so-called high throughput organic crystal packing package to allow you to quickly predict the crystal structure for many, many molecules at the same time. Yeah, so with this one, we hope now we can use this uh, uh, this uh, software development to actually to to develop a new uh, new screening tool to guide us to rapidly uh, uh, find the new crystals, new organic systems that would be interesting for this kind of uh, in terms of mechanical flexibility. So to sum up. So I introduced to you three different computational techniques. I spend most of time on talking about the atomistic simulation. How do we simulate the bending of the organic crystals? I also talked a little bit about how uh, our plan about this, about the idea of use, uh, using the crystal pa packing similarity tool to do rapid screening for the materials in the existing database as well as our plan on the prediction of new organic crystals from the molecular level. So they, we talked about, they make, we have developed a mechanism that can hopefully explain this bending phenomenon for the organic crystals. So they, at the moment, we are actually doing, we are doing a lot, we are actually actively doing this kind of computational screening and also uh, also developing the bendable or uh, bend, develop a database to uh, for this kind of bendable organics. So uh, to ask the question from the audience a uh, uh, few minutes ago, so we are also consider we are also considering the impact of bending on the electronic electronic properties in for instance charge transport. So this actually was kind of like very new. Um, uh, our new new plan. So I actually gave a similar talk two weeks ago in New York New University. So then um, a a professor in New York New York University actually uh, suggested me with uh, with a her uh, her like recent article. So in that article, she found actually when you apply the deformation, it actually has a huge impact in terms of the charge mobility for the organic semiconductors. So for instance, here you can see, so when you twist it more, when you twist it more, you can see they actually there is a significant boost of the mobility in both hole and the electrons. So therefore we believe, so this is related to the molecular motion, which we just described like rotational uh, the rotation of the molecules, also the phase change of the molecules, but uh, we haven't uh, studied. We haven't studied it so far, so this is still a hypothesis. But we believe this uh, our our uh, our results may be very useful to explain this phenomenon. So that's all about it. So if you want to read more details, so I welcome you check out the our paper, our recent paper. It's still under review, but the paper, the manuscript, manuscript is uh, available in the archive. Also, I would like to thank my group members and the collaborators for this project.
as well as the funding agency from NSF and Sony and the DOE. Finally, I would like to thank for your attention. So I'm a bit running out of, out of time. So I, I hope, uh, yeah, I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, if you have.